Hey friends, welcome back to Mark Lee Meets World. I am your host, Mark Levy, and I'm so unbelievably excited to be able to talk to you today about today's episode of Boy Meets World. Uh, it's a wonderful night. If you haven't had a chance to watch the episode yet, please watch it before we continue watching this, because you know, you want to watch it, so you know what we're talking about. So you have Disney+, Plus, DVD, sometimes streaming, whatever, Daily Motion. Uh, if it's randomly on syndication, you're going to watch Season 1, Episode 18. It's a wonderful night right now. Cool. Okay, so uh, when you, we get back from the jump, uh, my guest is awesome. One of my favorite people, one of the, a person that's been on the show a lot of times. Uh, Rachel Nielsen is going to be my guest. We're going to talk about the episode, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy it, and I will see you guys real soon. And we're back! Oh my god, that was such a weird transition. But you know, that's how it happens sometimes. I don't know if it was weird or if it was not. But I'm so unbelievably excited for, I think, the fifth time guest? I've uh, lost count. <laughs> my main guest, uh, one of my favorite people in the whole world. The one, the only Rachel Nielsen. How are you? I'm good. I'm nice and snuggly because it's cold here in Minnesota. So... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's the middle of November. That's that's how it happens sometimes, you know? It it, it was like 70 last week. Yeah, we're for some point, it was It was either last week or the week before, and then it dropped to like 40 degrees. And we're like, we're, mm, all right. Yeah, we're 49 <laughs> degrees in New York right now, which, you know, that's how it is. But, you know, that's the weather report uh, if you're watching today on uh, Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 20, 2020. <laughs> yeah, 2020. Uh, not 2021, not 2024, not anything like that um no. but yeah uh so we uh we talking about days that are in the past uh we're going to talk about today's episode of, of uh boy meets world which air which is it's a wonderful night it aired on march 11th 1994 it was directed by david trainer of course and directed by susan estelle jansen uh who i believe did not write any other scripts before this one i just want to verify that quickly on my end um but um the usual crew pretty much it was in well you know david trainer and yes. yeah that was and yes this was her first script for boy meets world nope never mind she wrote also seeing this little helper and killer bees Ooh. so i fuck up um and i'll be the first <laughs> to admit that uh, but yeah so i want to start with something that i'm afraid might be my own headphone issue but I literally rewound it four times to verify this in my own brain. Um, when it is the opening shot, the whole do 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 you know, like all the music, I heard a rocket sound. Um, so uh, I fast forwarded through the credits uh, no, this for is, this, this episode is before the credits, before the credits, like in the opening. Okay, sequence, before the, op the opening sequence, like the opening opening of the episode. Like I minute, didn't like hear second. a rocket. I heard like a weird whoosh sound and I don't know if it was my headphones or not, but I rebound it like four times. So I'm like, this doesn't sound normal. <laughs> Maybe I'm just tired because I didn't hear anything. <laughs> if you, if fans, if you haven't watched the episode yet, uh, pause it, of course. I mean, I already told you that beforehand, but you know, pause it. And then like, let's like watch the first 10 seconds of the episode. I heard a fucking rocket sound. That's all I know. Um, but yeah, so it's, <laughs> Starts off uh, with um, Air with uh, Sean and Corey. They're talking about how they're really excited to uh, hang out tonight, and they talk about the. Oh my god, I feel so bad for this babysitter. Yeah, well, like the babysitter, and they're just like, "Ooh," but, and I was like, "I remember getting babysat," and it was usually by like parents, friends, like teenagers yeah. and stuff like that, and it was just, I mean. I was like me and my siblings were babysat up until like my parents actually trusted to leave us home by ourselves. Oh no, that must have been late for you guys, considering I know. Well, like it was. <laughs> I mean, I think it wasn't until I was like at least like fifteen or sixteen, and like, that's late they, then. Right, well, shocker. yeah, yeah, but, I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> shocker, um, and I have a story for later on in the episode, which will not okay even be more of a shocker about. Uh, age things and stuff like that but no like and then they also told our neighbors like that we were home by ourselves so like if we had any questions like to ask our neighbors and i was just like 
we were like these good like sheltered christian kids like what could have we hit what prob- we weren't good like my i think my parents should have just been more concerned about my brother because he liked to jump off of things and he was totally fearless so he just liked to get into trouble and that was the, my biggest concern like as a babysitter I was like oh my god my brother's gonna jump off something he's gonna break his arm and i'm not gonna know what to do yeah. like <laughs> Yeah, my parents mainly took me around places. Like, I, I had a babysitter a couple times, but it was mostly, like, just, like, I was, my parents didn't really have a social life without me, except for, like, fancy events or whatever. But, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I feel bad so- them, t- oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you go first. I was like, I just feel bad for them, like, dogging the babies. <laughs> the, like, it's not even a real person, because she doesn't have any, lo- like, they only talk right. about her three times in the episode. Judy. And it's all about how bad her acne is. Like, <laughs> Feeny even says, like, she had a skin crisis. It must be bad. Her head is going to pop. <laughs> I was like, Feeny? No, like, everyone fucking dogs on her. Like, it's like, I don't think I've ever felt like I, I had I had bad acne for, for a while as can I got bad acne now because of like the stress anxiety of like 2020. But like, mm-hmm. that's a whole different story altogether. But right. like, yeah, yeah. No, I this I had I had acne as well. Um, that was not fun because when you're like going through when you're a teenager and you have frizzy curly red hair, not pink hair, but frizzy curly red hair and big Wait, old the pink's orange- not natural. No, <laughs> but I had these like huge orange glasses that like covered half my face and like. I had like triangle head, orange frizzy curly hair, and then you add acne on top of that, and me being being this pale, oh, that was fun. But yeah, no, acne is not fun as a teenager because you're like, why is my face exploding? And why is it vaguely hurt? <laughs> oh uh, yeah, no, it's awful. Yeah, um, <laughs> and then they start. Then they bring out the VHS of Barney teaches you ABCs, and Sean's like, no. This is parent camouflage. And I'm like, I definitely have like, done that once or twice, only like that many times. But I know friends have yeah. done that a lot more uh, because the VHS you're going to watch and I've got the title written down because it's the best title ever. I'm blowing <laughs> up your head. Part six, Stumpy's Revenge. So there were five previous installments of this movie. And we're going to talk about about the movie when we start hearing audio from the movie because that movie is fuck my word problematic even for the 90s uh yeah i was sitting there kind of cringing like hearing audio from the movie and i was like oh yeah like, it, we'll get there but it's <laughs> it's like if this was the 1980s it would mm-hmm. almost be okay but like that was some bad we'll get there we'll get there uh <laughs> but uh and then uh i love the part when uh they're talking about how it's our radar for violence and maybe some nudity but they'll fast forward to the nudity <laughs> and i'm like so no. prior- they, their priorities are different and eric's like well <laughs> yeah well my brain's like no the nudity's always the best <laughs> a really bad bad nudity like gratuitous nudity for nudity's oh. sake <laughs> I mean, I, I, as I told you before, I watched the movie Hell Comes to Frog Town, which is like the best bad movie ever, uh, where it literally is uh, post-apocalyptic. Uh, a Roddy, Rowdy Roddy Piper is like a person that is not deformed and everyone wants to fuck his dick. <laughs> my, my right. It's, it's great. It's it's an amazing movie. It's on Shudder. If you want to see like amazing bad 80s schlock, it's fucking great uh I'll, I'll put it on my list my non-existent list <laughs> i already showed you like a clip of the movie and you like yelled at me because it was like like i did not yell you can you were very mad at me because the movie is the the frog people are kind of scary looking to be fair everyone who is watching this on the interwebs i'm not really a horror person so it doesn't really like float my boat i mean yeah. I should preface, I do work for a haunted attraction, but horror movies are not not really my jam, unless they have comedy with them. And that movie has a lot of comedy, but, and that scene had comedy too, but, but you literally popped it on, and you're like, nope, I'm good. <laughs> like, literally, it was like, on 
off. That's how that's what it seemed like to me. And like five seconds in, there was comedy. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, Eric, a big thing in this episode is Eric should get his license uh, to learn to draw to drive, which is cool. I remember when I was going with getting my license, I was always a fun epidemic it felt like but you know got through it i do have a story that goes along with getting your license because i had some major deja vu when he so he fails his driver's test right and so he comes in and he's like yeah the guy in front of me told me to pull forward so like seriously the exact same thing happened to me i'm not even kidding and so that's why i had major deja vu so the first time i went to go get my license and just a little backstory like I didn't take my driver's test for the first time until I was 18 because my parents based it off of grades so like Uh, they which doesn't (laughs) surprise anyone here but like so and it was their version of like how my grades would be so like unless I was getting straight A's I was not allowed to go and take my driver's test so The first time I went and take my driver's test, I was 18 and it was in my, uh, so it was in my grandparents' car. And because for some reason I took my grandpa's car. And so my dad, not my dad was in the driver's seat and I was in the passenger seat. And this was at, in a suburb and we, so it was a course. It wasn't like you go and drive out the streets. It was a a course. And so there was was a parking lot like like cones and yeah. Well, like it was an actual made course for taking a driver test. So it wasn't like a parking lot. It was an actual like made course, like in the suburbs. And so there's this big sign that says, pull ahead and wait for the instructor. Like just this big sign standing there. And I was like, okay. And so my dad gets out of the car. There's a car in front of me. My dad gets out of the car and goes and waits at the little like shack or waiting yeah. place. So I, so I get around and I sit in the driver's seat. There is a car in front of me and they end up going and starting their test so um my dad told me once that person gets out and like once they to pull ahead he had already gotten on the car and gone so i listen to my dad and pull up to the line and i'm just so i sit, i'm sitting there waiting for the instructor the instructor gets in the, gets in the car and he's this older guy kind of cranky and he goes you know i should have failed you right now for what you just did and I go, what did I just do? And it's like eight o'clock in the morning and yeah. I am so anxious and nervous. And he goes, well, you turned the vehicle on without a licensed driver in the car. And I was like, I literally moved in my mind, like three feet. It was yeah. probably a car length, but like it, in my mind, it was like three feet. And so that didn't even start it off right. Plus it didn't help that the gentleman that was giving me the test was very homophobic and racist so that's a different story but i um he was he was making comments about people on the course of different ethnicities different ethnicities which was great and then so i ended up not passing the test because he was very cranky and crabby and what have you but i had major deja vu for when eric was like yeah so like i moved like two inches and i and they yeah. they failed me before the test even started so that was my story but yeah no i totally relate yeah i i Do you um, have a <laughs> i got lucky with my whole situation uh with the driving stuff because like i did that like in my like i remember it took me a few tries for the gold learners test and then like uh, I, I test learner's test and then um, there was a class in my high school for a driver's ed and I did mm-hmm. that and I passed and that was that got me my license yeah fun fact I got my license in Fargo at the age of 24 in the dead of winter at 8 a.m in the morning and I ended up backing over the parallel parking cone and I still passed I am a great driver. You have ridden with me. I am a great driver. But like, I, I was twenty. I'm just holding on for dear life while you drive. I'm like, yeah, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, uh-huh. yes, yes. But no, like, I. It was really funny because it, I was like, I was kind of scarred after taking it the first time, so I just didn't take it for a while. So yeah, I passed when I was finally 24. But like. Fun fact, it was in Fargo. It was in the winter. It was 8 a.m. in the morning. And, like, they just took me out on the streets and I drove around. I was like, this is easy. I can do this. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, And then, 
Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, oh boy. Uh, ooh, uh, I've got too many stories on Trevor's head. Uh, that's where I, all, all I'm going to say is this. That's where I was when 9 11 happened. Um, oh no. We were out in like the chorus, and then like that was second period. In the third period, I go to my science class, and my teacher with a very thick accent, uh, thick Italian accent, like tells us that that happened. I, and- I was 15 and I was in gym class, and like we ended up like we were in gym class, and then they like somebody came in and told the teacher, and we all like. We're having nine eleven and- stories right now on an episode that's half that aired seven. No, I, like I just remember, like we all went into a classroom and we were watching TV for like the rest of the day, and I had no idea like what was going on and why this was happening. But like that's it is, all yeah. So I was in high school as well. Anyways, back we're to the, the we're the same age. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so um, <laughs> b- back to the episode. Uh, I wanted to bring up the way that Alan and Ishi comes down dressed. I'm like, I have dressed exactly like that for dates. Am I like? five times uh it reminds me so much of my dad because like with my parents like my mom would look really nice get all dressed up for a date like put on like a cute dress um to her hair do her makeup and everything and she's like my mom would look great and my dad comes out in like clean jeans and like a button-up shirt he's like i'm ready to go and my mom was like you're in that well it's funny because like <laughs> uh betsy randall amy is like in like a uh like in a uh, bathrobe still in the scene in my mind like because i know she's like i feel like she's done this before on the show um mm-hmm. like in the future episodes like where she's like oh no i'm not ready and then she's out the bathroom and then like the dress is there and she's like you grab a look right and like, but like that's what i was expecting because she had her purse in her hand uh but then she could have been like going through it and making sure she had everything in there oh, like no, that was what was about, going through in my, my brain. brain was like oh <laughs> this is gonna happen like that um because that's such an amy matthews thing to do and then like mm-hmm. that didn't happen uh, and then uh, one of my favorite recurring characters in season one and two appears, Jason Morrison, for the second time. Um, and they I make love- a short. They make a short joke, <laughs> and I feel so. They bad. always make short jokes at his expense. Um, I want to point something out. Uh, I'm not going to show a clip or anything of this, but I don't know if you noticed this, but Jason Morrison and Will Friedel uh, are just exactly alike. Like, <laughs> uh, like a shirt, like a plain colored shirt a plaid mm-hmm. or like like a nice button up shirt and then a sleeveless hoodie um, i saw that i saw that <laughs> and like they like at first i'm like are they dressed like and then they kept like the uh, camera kept changing angles and i'm like they're dressed basically exactly the same but one of them was plaid, i think they did purple. that just to show like that they were like good friends also will friedel is rocking the middle part with his like hair but that, that was then, his look for the first two seasons though right no no i know I, I'm just like I was just so and Jason Morrison's rocking the mullet. Rocking the you know. mullet. Yeah. Yes. Like I was looking at that like 90s hair and I was like, ooh, yep. And then like it's, Alan is almost rocking the mullet. Like his yeah. hair is like pre-mullet, like baby he's mullet. He's got he's got the like <laughs> he's got kind of like the Roger Strong um Sean thing going on there a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. but yeah, like because I think that's like the longest Alan's hair ever really gets the like in this this is like the longest anyone's hair ever gets in the series like i think this season right like do needs a haircut but like <laughs> i mean we all do uh but i'll speak for myself uh but uh well and then like that's when we find out eric uh failed the test and they're like don't know what they're gonna do because he dates the hot girls and um and then What's gonna I don't happen? like those girls. I will just I say do right not now. not like those girls at I all. I don't like them. They both all. have five oh. lines in the episode. We'll get there. We'll get there. I, uh, I know. But and then, I like, don't Judy like them. calls up and she's like, and Judy. Eric is like, yep, 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 no, okay. And then hangs up the phone. Judy cancels. It's a classic like phone scene. Like especially for Wolf Fordell. Like Wolf Fordell is so good on like right. those weird, like, um, like you think it's gonna be one way, and then nope. Mm-hmm yeah it's a good like comedy bit that they have yeah. um and then they're like what we're gonna do there's like she canceled and i knew so, immediately it was going to feeny immediately we were staying up, in the kitchen yeah. yep <laughs> and they go outside and eric's like hey i have to go see a concert tonight i got a classic concert and Finney's like uh beethoven or mozart and then he's like beethoven and Finney's like a concerto or something else Symphony, and, yeah symphony and he's like anything says 
symphony. And then he's like, blonde and brunette. He's like, blonde. I'm like, ah! He goes, blonde, props. I mean, props. <laughs> <laughs> Like so that, really, that, that that's was a, a really funny joke there. That was a funny joke. I, yeah. I appreciate that. You gotta and, love the weird, like, horny kid knows his classical music enough to know who Brahms is. Also, Feeney knows him enough to know, like, yeah. all right, what kind of sticky situation are you in and what are you going to ask me to do? And then Feeney mentions <laughs> that Judy's head popped, uh, which is, oh, my God. Uh, yeah. And then he requests manual labor for babysitting. And I was like, Feeney's smart. Yeah, like, <laughs> this is one of those episodes where some of the adults come off very, very smart. Um, and we'll get there later, too, also on the other one, too. Um, but, yeah, so he, Eric is is going to do manual labor for, for five weeks in uh, his lawn. And then the next thing we see... That's a lot of manure. That's and a, a lot, lot of, of Sundays. <laughs> I mean, it's just, like, basically just, just three feet of manure, like, everywhere. I mean, he's, like, excellent. Like... <laughs> I don't know why I, I did that, but no, this no. is this is manure in Feeney's lawn. <laughs> uh, and then we get our first scene with Morgan, and she's like, and you can tell that when the camera's gonna turn, it's gonna oh, be hilarious. Absolutely. And- I loved it. I loved it so much. And I love that Feeney used the word festooned. Yeah, like, like so he- like Mor- uh, Feeney's got these like pearl earrings on, like grandma here, like costume right. pearl earrings, like yeah, the like, clip 20 on, necklaces yeah. on. <laughs> um and like and like he's like all dressed up and, and morgan wants him to wear a hat and then how old he, is morgan in this i think she's like so, eight or okay. so or so. if an eight-year-old asks you to put on a hat while you're playing pretend tea you put on that hat i mean she's okay. somewhere originally that like six and eight range i feel like yeah. you know um maybe closer to six i'm not sure if she's definitely of the age of like where she you know she's yeah also, um, she's smart. She knows how to push Feeney's buttons. Oh my god, she does. Uh, <laughs> also, we don't really learn if she actually did start crying or if she like fucked with Feeney. Because I'm pretty sure she's like fake crying to get Feeney to put the hat on. That's how I took it. Yeah. And then I don't know how this smart fucking happened. I don't know how this happened. We noticed that Feeney and Morgan are on one side of the living room. In the middle of the living room. Corey and Sean oh, yeah. are watching the movie at kind of high volume, like a decent enough volume. And then like when Feeney walks by, like get like uh like they food or whatever. They switch she said nature documentaries. I was wondering this too, because okay, so like if you've been in the living room with somebody and you're literally like three feet or four feet away they're from literally them, ten feet away. Like literally ten feet e- away. They're, they're by the front I'm of a horrible judge of distance, but like um you would hear that. Especially with the language going on in the movie, you would hear that. Unless Especially Phoenix... what's being said in that movie. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, I guess you're going to talk about. I'm going to blow up your head, part six, uh, Stumpy's Revenge. Um, Stumpy's Revenge. So, Stumpy. this is the most misogynistic movie I've ever heard in my entire life, uh, where literally every person that he's blowing up the head of is a woman. And yeah. we don't know if they're good or if he's good. Uh, it's implied that he's good, of course. But I think Stumpy is... Stumpy sounds like a serial killer. He, who likes to murder women with grenades in their head. Because um, I they, I know they mentioned bazooka at one point. Yeah. Um, and I know like they say grenade in the mouth at one point. Um, he's messed up. But like, it's just so insane. Like, Because like Stumpy's whole MO is there's a woman, there's a teenage girl in the shower who's naked i'm gonna kill her oh um, there's no logic or reasoning behind why he's gonna kill her he's just gonna kill her because she's a teenage girl naked in the shower of course of age because this is you know like something's not a creep he's just a he's just a killer we don't know that Stumpy is our hero in Stumpy's Revenge, and all women are the villains, uh, especially if they're naked, wet in a shower, or stewardesses. Um, because I know one of them is a stewardess at one point. Uh, but so, yeah, Stumpy's messed up. So yeah, this was of course incredibly questionable for the <clears throat> early ninety, well mid nineties at this point, and would be very questionable still even for the eighties if right. it's just the plot of the movie is man goes around murdering naked women. I feel like also like they so due to the wholesome nature of the show and to kind of make that contrast between like because like Sean was the one who rented the movie and he was because right. he kind of like instigates a lot of the shenanigans that they have so right. like 
in in Sean's brain, like this, like he probably told Corey, like we gotta watch this movie because like everybody else is watching it. Like, gotta be cool. You want to be popular. Like, let's watch this movie. So like Sean brings it, and then like Corey's like, but it's one of those like yeah. they have to make it either super violent or graphic or what have you. And I understand the language is not not great. But I feel like in contrast to the show, it does a good job because it, it is such that contrast to the wholesome nature of the I mean, show. Of course, it's not like cursing in the show because it is. Still right. Some, yeah, yeah. But like, this know. is why <clears throat> Feeny, like when Feeny sees it, he like freaks eventually, out. Eventually, when he eventually and, and, sees it. Yeah. Right. Right. And then when um, uh, Corey's it's parents. Al- yeah. Yeah. It's also really funny out. how the contrast of what they're watching with um. They're watching Caribou Births. It's yeah, I time. saw. <laughs> and it's just like very graphic uh, sounding uh, and kind of gross. It's like some natural geographic type stuff. And Phoenix just like, oh. oh. He's like, they're uh, watching something educational. I've done my job. <laughs> uh, so then they get a phone call. Uh, well, they, yeah, they learned that uh, Eric's car got towed. And the person at the that at the impound is Ogre from Revenge of the Nerds, um, which does all, it's always cool to see that guy who's like <laughs> who's also in Bloodsport, um, who's like always Tony a, with a Y. Yeah, he's like always <laughs> a really fun ne'er do well type. He's like six foot four, looks like a prison character. Like he's like that tough guy. Uh, if you haven't seen Revenge of the Nerds, I mean, he, his name is Ogre for a reason in Revenge of the Nerds. If you haven't seen that movie. <laughs> um, and he's just not giving Eric or Jason the time of day. And yeah. the girls are getting upset. And the girls uh, have a Camaro on the way. And like, and yeah, Eric's okay, like, okay. So uh, here's the thing. So like, Eric is like, please give me my dad's car back. So him and him and I can't remember what Jason. Jason J- I know Jason Marsden, but I don't know what his friend's name is. That his name in the show? Jason Marsden is the name of the actor and the character. Okay, I didn't know if that they did that as well. But like they're begging and pleading for um for Tony with a Y to give them their car back. And then the girls are like making an escape plan. They're like, um, so should we go with a junior with a Camaro? Like, like they have options. Like they they didn't even say who it is, it's a junior with a Camaro. And then they're like, okay, we'll take it, we'll take it. And then he's like, We don't even need you. And like instantly, instantly, instantly the girl goes and hops up on the counter. And uses her feminine wiles to get to like, the Y to get them the car back. And then they immediately tear up the, the receipt yeah. and like, and Eric's like, tape, tape, tape. Um, but I don't uh, like those girls because I was like, really, really? One okay. of those girls are recognized from Baywatch, which is a true. Yes, yes. Show. No, I, I recognized her, but it was just kind yeah. of like, obviously, these aren't two high quality women you nope, would want to go not. on a, a second date with. Um, and Eric makes even a statement. He's like, are you using us? Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, they are. They are straight up using you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they're not good people. They only have like five lines each, probably. And it's mostly flirting with Tony with a Y to get the car back. And then Tony with a Y like awkwardly reaches out for the one that's like sitting on the on the, on the the table. When she goes away, I'm like, that's kind of creepy, Tony with a Y. Uh, these are still yep. underage girls. Uh, mm-hmm. And then uh, Phoebe arrives with all the kids in tow. And, Phoebe wearing the earrings. <laughs> oh, it's just so like it's William Daniels with the earrings on is just a very delightful sight um, while still being full on Phoebe mode. Um, and Tony doesn't give him the car back because he's like, <laughs> no, because. Excuse me, he doesn't have a license, so I love that Feeney corrects his grammar because yeah. that is a very Feeney thing to do is to correct his grammar. And then Tony the Wise is like, I don't give, I don't give it to guys with earrings on or whatever. And you're like, Ugh, <laughs> that's that's been not dated well, uh, or it has been. I don't know. Don't be a fucking asshole. That's the best way to put mm-hmm. that. Um, <laughs> uh, and Tony the Wise doesn't care because Tony the Wise, yeah. Tony the Y is a fucking scary, creepy man. Uh, mm-hmm. And so then they all go back home. Uh, Feeney mm-hmm. is fucking mad. Feeney is really, really mad. Um, and and then he finds out what Corey and Sean are watching. Yeah. And then he pulled. <laughs> and this is like when it was at like the stewardess with the grenade and like all that stuff. 
And <laughs> uh, it's like maybe Infinity was just so <laughs> focused on the tea party he just didn't notice it. Uh, but then the tape. I mean, breaks. that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. But then the tape breaks. <laughs> uh, which that is such a funny, dumb thing that doesn't happen too easily in VCRs. Is any, like, <laughs> I honestly cannot remember the last time I watched a VHS tape. <laughs> I remember that, like, they didn't break like that for me when they broke. They would, like, snap, like, when every round of Right. Stuff. Like, I definitely know that it's it, it was a bit for the show but like there it takes some force and effort to get that tape out of that vcr like i mean to get the the ribbon get the out actual of, like ribbon out yeah. of the cassette yeah yeah um so sean's upset that um uh that the tape is ruined and mm-hmm. then all everyone goes up to the room to hang out um it's like wait um for for alan and amy come home and there's a really funny exchange of lines where uh, Alan comes home and he's just like fucking livid. And he's like, mm-hmm. Fiend, you're the worst babysitter ever. Right. And, and, and he's like, well, their kids are the spot of Satan. So in, Satan. Theory, <laughs> like, in theory, Alan is Satan now. Um, and basically, Alan proceeds to just yell at the boys while Amy's sitting there. And then he's like, go upstairs while we figure this out. And mm-hmm. I love the one line that Amy says, Uh, Oh no, Alan says, he goes, are you trying to undermine my authority? And he goes, not in front of our kids. Yeah. (laughs) Like, when they go upstairs, yes, then I will undermine your authority. Yeah, no, we're we're going to get into the Amy thing and uh, Betsy Randall for sure. But uh, (laughs) let's, the easiest way to put it is, she doesn't have much to do in that episode, but she has this really amazing monologue about, like, how she's waited 16 years for Eric to be able to drive so she can actually have a day Mm -hmm. off. Um, Yeah. Um, and then the, <laughs> like that's the best way to put that at this point because mm-hmm. uh, i do want to talk about i want to save the bulk of that for betsy Reynolds right, right. Of all, of all time because holy crap uh <laughs> oh yes such a good actress um yeah so the boys are upstairs waiting convinced they're about to die uh and then they find out they only have a two week um uh uh, uh, oh my god they're grounded for two weeks grounded for two weeks thank you i was like what, what's the word for grounded um <laughs> A thing I actually never was in my entire life. Big shocker there. Oh, uh, I was grounded so many times. <laughs> but you're the good kid. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, we know Dan is really the bad one. Uh, <laughs> I know your brother's not going to watch my brother, my brother will never watch this. It's <laughs> but a no, small like, chance, but it's probably very I, small. Okay, okay. Like, my parents are very protective and very sheltering, which I love them for it. Like, they they did a lot of great things, but like I spent so much time being grounded for stupid things, like being grounded for like getting bad grades or being grounded for like you know I don't know, like stupid things. And so like I'm very familiar with being grounded. <laughs> All right, uh, so the kids get grounded for two weeks, and um, uh, Eric has to study the Pennsylvania Street the State Drivers Test. Uh, and pass it once the two weeks is up, mm-hmm. and the whole time Corey gets sentenced to watching education. <laughs> and, and everyone's face when they put on the caribou, um, uh, throwing fecal matter. I think it was. I think so. I think. Wait, I wrote it down. Yeah. I wrote it down. I wrote it down. Um, the carib- uh, caribou marks his territory by flaying dung. So yes. Uh, yes. And everyone, everyone is like Amy is horrified. Corey is horrified. Alan's like, "This is gross, but this is important." Corey turns that yeah. Alan turns it back, like, um, and that's the end of the episode proper. And then we get to the <laughs> credit scene where it's definitely two weeks later, and like Morgan and Corey are like begging Eric to take him somewhere. He's like, "I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Please just let me live." And then we get the most beautiful reaction shot. Uh, yes, Amy Matthews just sitting there eating, sitting grapes, there eating grapes, just enjoying her life while watching the kids all fight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Alan comes in, and he's like, "Should we stop this shit?" Like, no, no. She's like, "This is my time." <laughs> yeah. Anything else we want to talk about in the episode proper before we continue with those um, other things? I'm just, what was it? I don't think there was anything else specifically that stood out. I just, I liked, um. I liked Feeney's moments, which were funny. Like, 
Um, it was definitely like a very nineties episode. That's it's just very the much feeling like the I most, got. It's yeah. the very it's like the most nineties TGIF episode I've ever seen of like yeah. anything. Yeah. Where it's like the kids are gonna watch an R A movie and the boys are gonna go on a date, but will it go good? Find out at eight PM. Right. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, totally. That's what that's the vibe that I got like, from and it. And then step and by like, step. <laughs> uh Mark, family matters. Mark gets bad grades. Um <laughs> Uh, Eddie plays basketball really well. I don't know. <laughs> yes, but no. Um, I think I think we covered everything that I yeah. wanted to talk about. Cool. So. Um, this is gonna be fun. It's now time for the Minkus Minute. Minkus Minute. <laughs> it uh, was not even there. <laughs> so okay, Minkus isn't in this episode as we know, but I do have a theory because. In the opening scene, there is an extra that looks so much like Minkus that mm-hmm. walks between them. Like, you see, like, their shoulders, like, in that little space between their shoulders. Mm-hmm. There's a blonde boy with, a like, a biker cap on that is, like, Lee Norris-shaped. I, <laughs> I didn't notice that. I know <laughs> like you did I know you did yeah. But, like, it's that thing in my brain. It's just, like, I was... Because I knew that, like, I saw Wikipedia that let Lee Norris is not in this episode. Right. But, like, in my mind, it's like, what if we... What if they just like, put a hat on him? <laughs> and, like, you're crediting this episode, getting paid, just walk by. That's it. I don't know. It's, like, one of, like, two episodes he's not in that he's in in the yeah. first season. Because he's, he's credited in every episode of the first season because he's above, he's in that title sequence. Um, but I... Guess that's the Minkus Minute. Minkus Minute. <laughs> uh, and now it's time for Betsy Reynolds' best TV mom in the whole world. A one, a one, a one, two, three, four. Betsy Reynolds' best TV mom. Yay. Um, holy crap. There's not much from her in this episode. There's not much, but like. That monologue that she gives where she's like, I've been waiting for this for 16 fucking years. You're not going to yeah. like take this away from me. Well, because my guess is like, because like Alan mentions, because he goes, I help out occasionally. Yeah. And like when you say that, like, so I know she she's a realtor, right? Yeah. Is that and this what, is actually okay. the most that it's ever mentioned in the whole, like in the whole like first part of the series. Like, right. I think it's like mentioned like twice, like literally one line of piece instead of being a plot, like, like it's a plot point in this episode. That's so, why they're they're it's why they're gone. Like they're going like my real- assumption is that she does it part-time because if she's home a lot with the kids and takes them to all of their various yeah. things, my guess is she does it part-time because that's that's what I gathered from that. Because if she's like, I take Cory to all his activities and Morgan to all of her activities, and then I gotta go to the supermarket and the dry cleaners and all of those places, like that that makes sense. And she's like, Well now if I can have Eric do that, like I actually get some time to myself rather than just like running myself ragged all day, every day. And she's like, do not take that away from me, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Like it's like, it's like the most intense thing that she's done. Like the whole series, I think like it's mostly just her being like, Oh, I'm a sweet mom. I'm a sweet mom. But like seeing that she really is the one that wears the pants in the family, seeing that she <laughs> is really this badass is mm-hmm. so great. I love her sitting there eating grapes she's like am i gonna read my magazines and then soak in the tub i'm gonna soak in the tub and then read my magazines what am i going to do yeah. she's like i have so many options like yeah it's not the like most of parenting in this episode comes from alan yeah um and but like it's one of those things where they gave her this really juicy like 30 second long monologue mm-hmm. um that's kind of funny but it's also like no i'm sticking up for myself right just no, thinking. like I, I, I definitely agree. She, she totally sticks up for herself, and I'm so happy because it's just like she's like now I can actually you know have some alone time or have some time to myself when I don't get it like ever or at all. <laughs> she's like, do not take that away from me. Yeah, I love it. It just, it just warms my heart because it's always good to see like good actors be able to. Oh, for like, sure. Like, and now that the writers are definitely like really understanding Amy Matthews at this point, like mm-hmm. because yeah. Like the, it, it's like the thing with like, it's a thing like with like Feeny when they like know they have something good and they just use it when they need to use it, you know. 
Oh, because Feeney definitely has some juicy scenes in this series. Like, yeah, they they definitely play to his strengths when they want to play to his strengths. And they're like, we're just going to we're just going to give you this. Go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, and this this episode is a very different kind of Feeney, but still a great Feeney. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, let's just bring this over to the episode MVP time because it feels right about that. It's like, I, you know, what I mean, right. I have a question. Sure. Does Feeney ever have any kids? No. Okay, because like the way he that he babysits Corey and Morgan would like, I mean, yes, he's a teacher, so he deals with kids, but like, um, I just yeah. I like like you can definitely tell that he's worked with children before, so like yeah. that's that's where I get that vibe, and I was like, hmm, I have I've never wondered. I mean, I have wondered, but never thought did Feeny actually have any kids, or like is this some unhidden storyline that we never heard of, or what? No, yeah, like, he doesn't <laughs> have any kids from what I'm aware of, um. But yeah, cool. Um, and now it's time for the episode MVP. Um, this is a pretty good episode for every character, for like five or six characters, my personal opinion. Um, mm-hmm. Like, I can even make a case even all the way down to like to James Morrison, even. But like, honestly, in my personal opinion, for me personally, the MVP is actually Mr. Feeney. Um, we get a lot, like, we get very funny Feeney at first, and then like we get mm-hmm. like very annoyed like it's just the range that Feeney has to go through in this episode it's really fun for me to watch um I like also like Will Friedle is also very up there for me in this episode and it's just a it's a good episode what about you who's your episode MVP so I also chose Mr. Feeney one because like he obviously cares about this family because like he wouldn't just like cancel his like weeknight it, I don't know if he had any weeknight plans but like he wouldn't just at the drop of a hat like go and babysit them if he didn't care for them yeah. also like if eric called and was like hey i'm at the the tow truck place i need you to come and get me if feeney feeney didn't care about them he would let eric figure this out and struggle by himself so obviously like he cares about them he cares about morgan because he'll do the tea party thing with her so like it definitely shows that like more like paternal side of Feeney in that sense where it's like he will definitely help them in a time of need if he needs that but also he will call them the, the spawn of Satan <laughs> so yes I mean like it definitely has that like range where like he obviously likes this family and like if he didn't he wouldn't do those things for them yeah cool um anything else you want to talk about the episode before we start wrapping up I think I'm good Cool. Um, let's uh, t- t- let's do your plugs because uh, you've been fucking killing it on TikTok recently. Um, <laughs> yes. So I film stuff. I film stuff and put it on TikTok. Uh, some of it's cosplay. Some of it's comedy. Uh, some of it's just whatever I'm feeling like at that time of day. So um, my TikTok handle is right there in my little name. It's at r 2 neil 2 Um, It's the same on Instagram as well. Most of the stuff will transfer from TikTok to Instagram, but that's what I, this is my, my backdrop behind me. This was from filming last night. Yeah. (laughs) So I, that's what I'm kind of doing during this whole pandemic, just to kind of keep busy and just kind of have a creative outlet for things. So if you want to see me look like an idiot or appreciate me dressing up as Ariel or other, <laughs> other characters, definitely check those out. So that's what I've been up to. Yeah. Uh, for me, we got coming up this week. We got a really, we have an amazing interview tomorrow. That I'm very excited about. I'm going to have Karushma Patel um, at 8 PM Ooh. on uh, live on the YouTube stream. Very excited. If you don't know who she is, she is, I believe, the first Indian American uh, female survivor player, but I'm not positive. Um, it seems like a very strong possibility, but it's not the case. She's one of the few. Um, she also right. is one of the more endearing, awesome people from uh, from her season of Survivor, which was season three and nine, Island of the Idols. Um, but um, we're very excited to have her on. Friday, we got Brant, Mark Talk, Brant Steele Day. Um, and then on Monday, we have back to our third miscellaneous Monday. Anything can happen if you want to act on it. If you want to do anything on it, let me know. Um, I, like, I'm having a blast. I had someone talk about Ted Lasso last week. Yesterday, uh, my friend uh, Lane Allen, she talked about um, psych, psych, psychopathy, psychopathy, which is pretty cool um, to learn about that. And, you know, I then ranted about how cool Prospect Park's new arches, well, restored arches. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's like, it's a variety vibe. 
Um, but yeah, uh, Rachel, I'm so happy to have you on here. Also, Yay! if you want to uh, be part of the show or have a question for the show, we're almost at the end of season one. Yes. Um, email markremeetsworld at gmail.com and I will get back to you. Um, and of course, you want to follow me on anything at marklevy85. I will see you guys next time. Rachel, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye.